Many people rely on uh, evidence for evolution from biology, but in fact the record of evolution comes from fossils. And so fossils are really important to understanding what life uh, has done on Earth. And so it's a very uh, important part. And so we're going to we're going to get into that today. Before we get into that, um, the way science kind of has operated in the past, and it wasn't until the work of, of uh, von Humboldt, uh, Alexander von Humboldt, that uh, we began, we we sort of began to see the collectiveness of you know how all things affect one another, and that we looked in, at things like paleo uh, ecology. He was looking at ecology, but we also look at paleo uh, paleoecology in the fossil record, and so really that stands in contrast to systematics and taxonomy in some ways, uh, because systematics and taxonomy, really biological classification is the sort of scheme that we were given first, and later it evolved into how do these things uh, relate to one another. So when we talk about systematics and ecology, we're really talking about Carl von Linney. Uh, he was C Carolus Linnaeus, and so you know Linnaeus probably. He was a Swedish, uh, Swedish botanist, but he wrote Systema Naturae, and it's all about how we classify animals. And so that's one of the earliest sort of techniques that people used in science. How do we classify things? Today, um, we go into the classification scheme knowing that there are different hierarchies. In other words, there are different ranks of how we treat organisms. So, for instance, in the modern classification scheme, some people talk about um, things like realm as, a, as, a, uh, as an idea. But... Traditionally, it's always been the highest possible division would be called the domain. And so domain, above domain, you might include the realm, which would include all things that are under a few domains. There's like one domain that's a little bit of an oddball, so we'll get into that in a bit. Um, in the old days, they used to call it five kingdoms, right? And so kingdoms were the step below domain. And then uh, phyla or phylum, the singular, um, is how we further break down kingdoms, and then also we have class order, family, and then finally when you get down to the lower levels of classification, we're talking about the genus, or we're talking about genus and species. And so it was Linnaeus who gave us this idea of a genus and species, and they call that the binomen. It's two parts to the name. So for instance, as a human being, we are homo sapiens. Um, there are other ones I can mention in here, like, for instance, when we talk about redwood trees, we may be talking about Sequoia sempervirens. And so the genus is Sequoia sempervirens is the specific name, but actually you have to say the whole thing in order to say the species. So Sequoia sempervirens, we make that distinction just so you don't confuse it with any other potential ones that are any genus that may have sempervirens as a generic name, excuse me, as a, as a specific name. Um, so those rules that govern how how we use the binomen, and there's a lot of people specialize in this. It's uh, in systematics and, and taxonomy, as you might ex expect. They use the International Code for Zoologic Nomenclature, or I ICZN. You can get a free copy of that from the internet somewhere. But it talks about different kinds of ways that we rec recognize species. You know, how about how we how we treat the names that go along with species. And so... So my question to you is, what constitutes a separate species? In biology, we think that it's the interbreeding and the potential for having viable offspring that gives us a species. And so, for instance, uh, we, can have, we can have some hybrids, but typically they aren't, like the mule, for instance. Typically they aren't, they don't produce viable offspring. So the mules typically do not uh, have their own foals and, and colts and so forth. Right. So but that is a hybrid, for instance, and we can we can generate hybrids as well. Uh, but in paleontology and you look at the fossil record, you can't show if something was interbreeding or not. You know, it's like you can't stick the two fossils together, in other words, and expect to find new fossils out of that. Um, so there are notable differences in structures is what we see. And so, for instance, in, and it kind of varies by the group, for instance, in gastropods, the snails, right? So in snails, typically we think of it as some sort of shell ornament in paleontology. So if you have a different ornament than some other genus, then it's going to be considered a different genus. Um, so, uh, 
that's how we go about identifying species as fossils. And it gets kind of complicated because sometimes we don't even preserve the fossils. Okay, so we're going to talk about fossil preservation as well. Um, so, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. That's the system, the classification scheme that we have, and of course the binome, which is the genus and species. So, in the domain Eukarya, we have four kingdoms. Okay, Eukarya means that it's eukaryotic cells, cells that have a cell nucleus. We have the kingdom animals, or kingdom animalia, or kingdom plantae, or kingdom fungi, or kingdom protista. Those are four different types of kingdoms that exist within the domain Eukarya. Eukarya. Um, the other domain is bacteria. And in bacteria, we can have sometimes eubacteria, which are the true bacteria, which would include bacteria, regular bacteria and also cyanobacteria, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. We're going to talk about all these things, in fact. So that's the domain uh, bacteria. And then there's also the domain archaea. Now, some people want to raise these up to something they call the realm. So archaea, in fact, are what we call archaebacteria or ancient bacteria. And so those are six kingdoms to pay attention to, I guess. So animals, plants, fungus, protists, uh, eubacteria, and then the archaebacteria. So that's our kingdoms to begin with. So if we go into the eukarya and we wanted to just classify the common dog that you would find, we could go and say, yeah, it belongs to eukarya. It's composed of eukaryotic cells, cells that have a nucleus. It's an animal, obviously. A dog is an animal. And the phylum would be chordate. In other words, it has a, a notochord that runs through it. And in fact, we have a notochord that, in fact, is a vertebrate. And so you can even place you know, vertebrata in this as well. Uh, it's in the mammals. So it's class uh, phylum chordata, class mammalia, order carnivora, family canidae, genus canis, and the species is canis familiaris. And so... You can see on here where I've tried to break this down, the eukaryotes up here, that's a eukaryote in the upper right-hand corner. It's kind of related to jellyfish. So jellyfish and dogs are related because they're both animals, okay? And jellyfish and, and, and fish are related to one another, of course, because they're both animals. And, of course, they're both related to dogs because, again, inclusive of all animals. The chordates would include things that are like the fish, but the jellyfish doesn't have a, a notochord. With the mammals, we're actually talking about things as widespread as like rhinoceri or, or perhaps um, giraffes, as like in the image here. And then, of course, badgers even. So badgers are carnivorous animals, carnivorous mammals. And, in fact, they are kind of related to dogs, but not in a very close fashion. But if we got to wolves, that's a little bit closer to the common dog. And fox, too, is, the, uh, is a canid as well. And so the wolf is even closer. And then, of course, the common dog, Canis familiaris here. So if we did the same thing with humans, we'd follow the same line all the way down until we got to the order, which is the order primate. And then from within the primates, there's a group that are called the hominidae, hominidae. And then, of course, we're homo sapiens. So there's Mr. Bean down here on the lower left-hand side. And so we also have some ancient species that belong to the human race. And so Homo erectus and Homo uh, heidelbergensis are a couple of those, in fact. So um, that's the classification of humans right there. When people look at these groups, one of the most common ways that we do that is through um, a scientific process called cladistics. Cladistics gives us an objective way to assess the distance between various organisms and how they're related to one another. With fossils, it's very difficult to do that, so we have to do it based on the characters that each one of those fossils has. So, for instance, trilobites are not exactly crabs or anything like that, but they are both arthropods, and so insects also are, belong to the arthropods. And so there are things that, that link us together, okay, with other groups. And so when we talk about the sort of idea of comparing characters from one fossil group to another fossil group, we often use what we call uh, a term called outgroup, and so we always include an outgroup. And then we recognize also that some of the characteristics that link that group together may in fact be uh, 
uh, just by coincidence almost, or convergent evolution perhaps. And so that's the idea that these characters may actually develop separately in different branches. And so when we talk about that, we like to talk, for instance, about um, reptiles are related to birds, right? And crocodiles and, and um, well, and turtles and things like that, right? So all of those are, in fact, monophyletic. They all belong to the same branch, essentially. And so that's everything that is a reptile, essentially. And so the birds came out of the reptiles. And so did the crocodiles and so forth. But if we looked at the mammals, the mammals also came out of the reptiles, but slightly in a different way. So if the amniotic egg is the thing that separates reptiles from the amphibians, mammals also were able to come out of the reptiles, but in fact, uh, that would be considered polyphyletic, arising from more than one of those stems, if you will. And then there's something called paraphyly, same thing. So it's not quite mono, uh, monophilic, but or it's not monophyly but it is in fact something that unites a group with the exclusion of perhaps one other group. And so this diagram kind of shows you how things are related. And so we all have vertebrates. We, we are all tetrapods, amphibia, reptiles, even birds are, are, you know, tetrapods. They have the two wings and the two legs, of course. And so, and so the reptiles you know, go off of that. And early on there were reptiles that were mammal-like in their structure, in fact. So, um, so yeah, when you develop certain characters and it happens more than one time, uh, through evolution, it's what we call convergent evolution. So with that idea in mind, we're going to get into the fossils next. And so there are different types of ways that fossils are preserved. So one of those is the original shell material may be preserved. In the case of many vertebrates, in fact, you find the bones and so the bones will be preserved but not necessarily the, um, the soft parts, right? And so the soft parts may have gone away and de deteriorated, whereas the bones would be left behind as original material. Replacement is another way. So sometimes minerals will percolate through uh, bones and so forth, or in the case of like petrified wood, you can actually have uh, pore fluids in that uh, dead animal, <laughs> or that dead plant in this case, uh, be replaced by silica, which in a, a fluid in sor sort of environment in the subsurface will replace the cell structure on a one-to-one -one basis molecularly. And uh, we call that permineralization. So it's very common that you get either permineralization or you just get a, a complete replacement with silica. And we know that, for instance, wood is not a, what, uh, um, it's not made out of silica, right? But in fact, the silica come, has to come in and replace it. So that's a replacement. So permineralization is additional material that may be preserved in some of the pore spaces as well. Recrystallization. Sometimes when animals are made out of calcite, they actually have a process by which that calcite may become mobile and reprecipitate, and that's called recrystallization. So you can actually recrystallize fossils that are made out of calcite, perhaps. And it's also kind of common sometimes with uh, with some other sorts of uh, organisms as well for for replacing the calcite in their structure. So for instance, in trilobites, the chitin gets replaced by calcite. Um, dissolution is another way. Sometimes we only preserve where the shell was, perhaps. And so there, that especially happens in uh, gastropods. Gastropods tend to go into solution fairly easily because they're made out of uh, aragonite. Aragonite and calcite are like this. They're very similar to one another. They both are composed of CaCO3, but aragonite is a different mineral than calcite. And so one has a certain coordination number and the other one has a different coordination number. And calcite may come in and replace at some point that aragonite or alternatively, you cause the aragonite to actually be dissolved. And so dissolution, we can actually leave the pore space behind. And so when that happens with uh, gastropods, they actually have a name for it. It's called Steinkern. S-T-E-I-N-K-E-R-N. So it's a German name that re re it tells us that it's an internal mold of the creature that was once there as a shell. Uh, carbonization is another way. So that very commonly happens with plant material. So here's an example right here uh, with petrified wood where we have replaced the mineral with, uh, replaced the wood with silica in this case. So that's a replacement. Um, and not so much permineralization in that case. 
Uh, in geology, we always use a scale, so I didn't use a scale when I took a photograph of this. This is from, uh, what's the name of the place? It's out in west, uh, it's the eastern part of Arizona, so it's the Petrified Forest. That's what it is. It's a, it's a national monument, and so you get these trees. Some of them sequoias, and some of them are like pine trees, I guess, but they were all living and then they died and then they got buried by volcanic ash and because volcanic ash is rich in, rich in silica that many of these wood particles that were left behind by an eruption these things were actually replaced by silica in the subsurface and and some of them were even upright okay so some of the stumps are actually up upright and have been replaced by silica as well. And in, in addition to that, these are kind of agatized as well. So there's a beautiful, this petrified wood that you see here. So yeah, don't get caught trying to take any of that out of that national monument because they will bust you. This is the sort of place you may think you have a license as a geologist. Forget about it. Don't try to break any of these laws in the national parks. It's a federal crime. Um, so usually they just give you a stern warning, but they will actually check your vehicle in places like this. We've had field trips that have gone out to the petrified forest before, and they will stop our vehicle and take a look around underneath the seats and so forth. So be careful what you do. Don't break any laws, okay? Um, but always use a, a photo scale. I kind of broke the unwritten rule about why didn't I put you know, some sort of scale in front of that. So you could tell how large it is. Well, I can tell you that that, at least from what I recall anyway, is about a foot high. So it was a fairly large chunk of wood right there, petrified wood. In this case, um, here's the next uh, set of fossils we're looking at here. These are bivalves and bivalves and brachiopods are, are going to be one of the things that you're going to learn how to tell the difference in. These have been replaced or recrystallize, and so the original material in some of the bivalve, at least, is aragonitic, but some of it is actually calcitic as well, So, but the original aragonitic material, that is the nacre that's on the inside of a bivalve, is going to be replaced by calcite, typically, and so bivalves are typically not a good sort of fossil to test for when you're doing geochemistry for stable isotopes or something like that. We'll talk about stable isotopes later in here. Another type of preservation is the stein cairn, which I already mentioned. Here is a couple of snails here. You can see that the one on the left-hand side, that's the internal whorls on that snail, and there's an old penny there for scale. And you can see that it actually is what they call a high-spired gastropod, but it filled in with mud at one time, and then the shell itself actually got dissolved away. Well, the shells in arag are aragonitic in gastropods, and... Sometimes you can actually preserve those whorls where they're very tight, and you can see that on the right-hand side over here. Both of those are stein cairns, and so if you have that internal mold, if you will, of the creature itself, that's a stein cairn. And again, that's a type of mollusk, and so with uh, with gastropods like the pelecipods or the bivalves, bivalvia. Those are sort of things that will at some point either be, you know, usually dissolved in some sense or replaced or they will be filled in with sediment like this and preserved, in fact, as open porosity with an internal um, casting from that, that structure. Um, so what kind of structures, what kind of preservation do we have with each one of these? Well, that's an insect over here on the right hand side. It's preserved in amber. It's very old. I think it's Eocene in age. They find amber very commonly in the Baltic. They also find it in places like Hispanola. Hispanola. Um, and so these are sort of like tree saps that were preserved as essentially a, a pseudo-mineral-like um, amber. Okay, so amber is one of these things that's not really a rock and it's not composed of minerals. But in, well, I suppose you can call it a rock, but it's not composed of minerals. It's tree sap that's been hardened somewhat, and, and very commonly these things will preserve insects. And so that's an insect in amber on the right-hand side. That's the original hard parts, in fact, uh, made out of calcium apatite for the shark tooth. It's just like your teeth are made out of calcium apatite. Shark teeth are preserved. Most of the rest of the shark, of course, is cartilaginous, and so they don't have a backbone necessarily. Very commonly, they don't have a backbone and so uh, that material will be degraded and and will be uh, not preserved, whereas the teeth, in fact, are preserved. And, of course, you know the story about Glossoptery on the island of Malta uh, and how Steno proved that those things were actually from sharks, okay, so Glossoptery 
On the left-hand side, it's a type of brachiopod. And so brachiopods and bivalves may look superficially alike, but there are different platens of symmetry in them. But when you actually get to the skeletal structure, the way what's the material made out of that that fossil is made out of on the left-hand side here, it's, it's a variety of brachiopod. In fact, they used to call them um, inarticulate brachiopods because they didn't have a, a complex hinge structure for the two, two valves to um, be manipulated on. They do have a little bit, but they were called inar inarticulate brachiopods. We also call them calciphosphatic brachiopods today, so calciphosphatic brachiopods. And I don't have a scale in that either, but those things are usually about three, two to three millimeters in length there, and I don't have a scale for the uh, the other two items on here either. So uh, just a reminder, it's like, yeah, even your professor can make some mistakes sometimes. And so it's good to have a scale for these things. Here's a type where you've actually replaced some of the calcitic uh, part of this type of brachiopod with pyrite. And so usually you have to etch away most of the stone and then the pyrite comes in afterwards and fills in. So pyritization is one of the key processes by which we can also have fossils preserved. And so in the upper left hand side, that's a cephalopod up there. You can tell because it has the chambers in it. It's a relatively young cephalopod when it died and was preserved eventually with uh, pyrite. Well, on the right hand side, that's a brachiopod. And there's a little tiny bit of calcite you can still see preserved uh, where the shell would have been on the over on the left hand side there, just off of the what they call the, um, the uh, sulcus, I think. No, it's not the sulcus. It's the, yeah. I'm one of the few people that's ever taken a course in brachiopods, but it's been 25 years, yeah, 30 years. So anyway, that is a type of preservation that we call pyritization here. Um, other times, you can take things like brachiopod, or excuse me, trilobites, which were made out of chitin, but also lightly calcified when they were living creatures. And if the parts kind of fall apart and collect in the sediment, sometime Sometimes, just like with the fossil wood, you can have silica come in and replace those parts. So it will sometimes come in. Now, these are actually from, I think, called a, an area called the Glass Mountains in West Texas. And they take large blocks of limestone and they dip them into acid. And the acid eats away the limestone. But it leaves behind these silicified bits and pieces of trilobites. So those are silicified trilobites right there. Here we have another type of preservation where we have a, a uh, well, it's like a fern, right? A fern leaf on the left-hand side there and a fern on the bottom down here, and they've been carbonized. The carbonization is another type of process by which you remove all of the lipids, the proteins, and things like that, and you leave behind the carbonized pieces as solid material from plants. So carbonization, very common in, in plants. Um, on the left-hand side, in this image, you can see a preservation that's called <laughs> original hard parts. And so that is the original part right there. And in fact, it's probably not even a fossil. In fact, uh, you can see the nacre in there. So the aragonite has been preserved with a little bit of chitin organic material in there as well. So when do things actually become fossils and when do the, you still consider them just the skeletal material of something that has died? That's a tough, that's a tough question to answer, actually. So sometimes, as in this case, it's not really fossil. It's just a dead <laughs> seashell, if you want to call it that. But it preserves both valves of that bivalve there. And here you can see the symmetry of that. So uh, bivalves have a tendency to have this sort of symmetry where um, you know it goes between the valves like that. Whereas brachiopods, it's more like. Uh, through the valves like this. And so that is the line of symmetry for brachiopods. This is the sort of symmetry between the valves when you have bivalves. Um, on the right hand side, you can see there's a tar sand that actually preserved an insect in this case. So even chitin can sometimes be preserved under the right situations, under the right circumstances. Um, next slide I show you is where you have a brachiopod, or that's actually a bivalve at the top, and you can see that it's start, at least partially replaced by calcite here. If you dropped S on it, it would fizz. And some of it may be recrystallized, in fact. So both of those are very difficult to tell apart, whether you've got something that's recrystallized or not. And so then you have to look for other clues in order to figure out what its mineralogy was all about. 
There are other types of fossils. The ones that we've already looked at so far, we'd all, we would all call those body fossils, at least partially related to how that fossil was preserved. Um, body fossils, so you're talking about shell structure or teeth or things like that, or in the case of trilobites, the sclerites or the pieces that make them up. Other types of fossils, like this one over here, that's the Lacinoides, um, is a trace fossil. So sometimes trace fossils tell us a lot more about the behavior of these animals, whereas the, the fossil itself, the body fossil, is not going to tell us much at all. Uh, typically, Thalassinoides is either made by, uh, I think they're mostly by shrimp, as, as I recall. There's another one called Cassian, Cassianella, I think it is. Cassia. Anyway, Thalassinoides here is an ichnospecies. So if there are trace fossils, we call them ichnogenera and ichnospecies. Ichnology is the study of trace fossils. And so where body fossils are actually preserved, it's not the trace then. <laughs> the trace fossils are actually the tracks, the trails, and you know the sort of behaviors where they shuffle through sediment, perhaps. Um, and here you can see some that were you know, burrowing through soft sediment at some point. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of trace fossils. The study is called ichnology. People can spend their entire careers doing that. Uh, so in places like, uh, well, they'd work in universities as a research scientist. Uh, University of Kansas, we have a fellow um, who is an ichnologist, and he is, um, well, Steve Hasiotis is his name. So he studies the behaviors of animals, essentially. And so how do we figure out what the animals were doing for either feeding, resting, or just trying to protect themselves, perhaps. And so they're mostly uh, defined by shape. So the one at the top in this image is called Cruziana. There's some that have this sort of uh, Dictian, I think it's Dictianella or something like that. They're patterns, okay, that the animals will make either through burrowing or through some sort of preservation. When you have other types of burrows as well, worms can get into sediment and leave behind uh, the places where they used to live or where they used to feed. There's some real famous ones around Springfield. There's a there's a ichno species called Sclera tuba missouriensis, and so you'll find worm tracks, in fact, in what they call worm rock around Springfield. It's from the Northview Formation. It's lower Mississippian in age, and so here you can see some of the uh, burrows on the third level of this. And uh, there's one another variety. It's called Zophicus, where it's an animal that left behind a fan sort of shape pattern. They also call it a, a rooster tail, if you will. And so rooster shape, uh, like the, the tail on a rooster has uh, a kind of like a, an arc, if you will. And so that's the sort of shape that it makes uh, when these things were feeding or perhaps even like gardening. <laughs> you can think about it that way. Some of these things actually may have raised their own algae um, and, and fed off of the algae then perhaps. At least that's what one hypothesis is for Zophicus. But trace fossils give us an understanding of a little bit about animal, how animals behave. And so that's kind of important uh, as well. Um, so with that in mind, now you know how things are classified, what rules you have to follow. They're in the ICZN, okay, and so that gets pretty complex, in fact, so we're not going to get into that in any depth in here. But we are going to look at some of the fossil groups and look at some of the biology that goes along with these fossil groups. So there's a whole bunch of them, <laughs> and this is why this is going to be a really long presentation, so I'm going to probably break it up into... Uh, you know, three or maybe even four presentations. But as we go through here, I'm going to talk about stromatolites, forams, radiolaria, diatoms, flagellates. You can go through the list here. Coccolis or another one. Coccolis give us chalk. Uh, and then we get into the primitive fossil groups like the sponges, the cnidarians. We get into bryozoans, brachiopods, mollusks. And so mollusks, in fact, can be divided into monoplacophora, polyplacophora, bivalves, cephalopods, and gastropods. You're going to be able to tell the difference between these, okay? So that's why I'm even showing you this, is that you're going to be able to recognize a mollusk for what class it belongs to. For bryozoans, you'll know that bryozoans and brachiopods are like this. They don't look the same, but they are part of the same family tree, in fact. And so that's what we have with some of the more primitive groups. And then we also have arthropods. And so arthropods, in fact, give us the trilobites, the insects, crustaceans uh, like crabs and so forth, lobsters. And then there are other ones like the eurypterids. Eurypterids are really pretty cool. They grew up to like nine feet long. 
and lived in the Silurian. So Eurypted's a real common sort of uh, animal in the Silurian of places like New York, for instance. Um, Echinoderms are related to the kind of fossils that we have around Springfield, like the, the crinoids. And so crinoids are a variety of echinoderm. They're still with us today, in fact. So crinoids live in the deep sea today, whereas in the past they lived in shallow oceans. Um, other ones, starfish, you know about. Echinoderms are like uh, sea urchins, right? So sea urchins, blastoids are extinct, actually. So blastoids went extinct in the Mississippian. Uh, and rhombiferans are also extinct, and so those are all types of um, echinoderms. We're going to finally get into the hemichordates, which would include the graptolites. Graptolites had a, a sort of a primitive notochord, if you will, but they lived as a stalked colony, essentially, and so graptolites. And then next we get into the conodonts, and kind of like shark teeth in a way, except they're little tiny microscopic sort of fossils, but they're probably the most useful fossil that we know of in Paleozoic into Mesozoic Age rocks. And so the conodonts arose in the Lake Cambrian and went extinct in the Triassic. And so conodonts are a very important fossil for telling us the relative age dates of the rocks that we're dealing with. And again, you can take a limestone, dissolve it, and sieve out the conodonts and you'll find out exactly what age of rock you're dealing with if you have a limestone um, as long as it's a marine limestone and as long as it's somewhere between the upper cambrian and the triassic right so you have to get the right age rocks um, fishes have been around since the cambrian as well so fish we, we're going to look a little bit at fish and then we're going to look at a few of the plants as well so to start it all off we're going to look at stromatolites is in and, and some other microfossils that are like the diatoms, the protists, and so forth. So that's where we're going to start this journey. So I'm going to end this one right here. This was kind of the introduction. So we'll get into the stromatolites and I'll record it separately. So it might make a lot more sense to do a whole series of different recordings, I think. And so that's, uh, that's the introduction to fossils. Thanks. Talk to you in just a minute here.